Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. And this week, your Harry Potter friends will be better friends to each other than Harry is to Hagrid, Lupin, and Hermione as we discuss Chapter 14 of Prisoner of Azkaban Stapes Grudge. But before we get to chapter by chapter today, we have a few announcements. One of them is very, very exciting, so we won't bury the lead. It is time to unveil the 2023 MuggleCast patron physical gift. Every year, we create a new physical gift for Slug Club patrons to thank them for supporting us. We're very excited to be able to do this. I don't think a lot of Patreons do this because it's tough to make the numbers work. We're very excited to be able to offer a physical gift and still use our Patreon funding, our Patreon support to um, run the show. So we can do both things. We're very excited about that. The 2023 MuggleCast physical gift for Slug Club patrons available to order now is the MuggleCast Beanie. Dun, 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 dun. You gotta get a drum roll under that. Dun, 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 it dun, looks dun. so good. It does look good. I'm modeling it off now. How does it feel? It feels great. This is a well made beanie. When I first held it, I was like, dang, this is like thick. It, it's good. It's a dense knit. It's got a muggle cast patch on the front. It's got three colors on the top going around the top, blue, green, and yellow. These three colors were chosen and pulled from our album art. And conveniently, who who caught this? Was it I think one it of us me. here? It was Eric. Each of the colors is also one of our Hogwarts houses. Sorry to Gryffindors. But <laughs> yeah. All apologies. We're leaving Gryffindors Gryffindor. out again. <laughs> Gryffindors were not invited to the hat design. Don't forget about the poof. And yes, it's got a poof. Uh, a, a palm. Yeah, on top. Uh, this isn't the final version that I'm displaying on camera right now. The 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 palm on top, the poof, whatever you want to call it, is gonna have <laughs> colors in it too. Um, so we're very excited about this. It looks great. Everybody's going to love it. I think to receive the 2023 gift, the MuggleCast knitted beanie, pledge by August 1st, 2023, at the Slug Club level to be eligible to receive yours. You must remain pledged for three months to be able to receive yours. You can also pledge for a year up front, by the way, to receive a small annual discount. Now, here's the thing, and this is really important. All Slug Club patrons who want to receive the beanie must fill out the order form that's on our Patreon. Again, by August 1st, we say with peace and love, peace and love must (laughs) fill out the order form by August 1st. We are a small group a small team. We can't accommodate orders past August 1st. So please get your orders in. If you have any questions, reach out to us on Patreon. And again, if you're not a patron, it's not too late to receive this gift and future physical gifts. We do one of these every year. Patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Thank you, everybody, for your support. And we can't wait to get this out to everybody. One of the things that I do really like about our physical gifts is that obviously we put a lot of thought into it, but they're durable. They last for hopefully years, right? And it's not just something that you throw away after a couple of weeks or a month. It's something that hopefully you can keep for a long time, like t-shirts and mugs and tote bags. And I think that this hat is something that people are really going to enjoy. That's well said. Yeah, I get a lot of mileage out of each of my previous year's physical gifts. I just can't stop taking them around and wearing them. And <laughs> they're not faded or damaged or anything. Every Sunday, I go to Trader Joe's. Every Sunday, I exit my car, open the trunk, pull out my MuggleCast tote bag, yes. and I bring it into Trader Joe's and I use that thing. We work with some great vendors, y'all. Yeah, we work with some great people, too. We couldn't do this without them. So we're, we're very, very fortunate to be in a good place with these gifts. So patreon.com slash MuggleCast. And thanks, everybody, for your support. We really could not do this show without you. I wanted to shout out a new production. Uh, Some of us may remember Puffs, the play, or Seven Increasingly... (laughs) I'm forgetting the long name. uh, At a School of Magic and Magic. Anyway, there's a new production in Chicago, and it's done by Otherworld Theater Company on Clark Street, and uh, I happened to see it. It's actually a show that centers uh, non-binary actors in the roles that we're familiar with, and it's uh, portions of the tickets go to Howard Brown Health, 
which makes it uh, is doing great things for LGBTQ individuals. So uh, it's a new production with a lot of heart. And I just wanted to shout out if you're in the Chicago area, it uh, is going for another three weeks and you should consider trying to see Puffs, a really, really, really funny show, a good send up of the Harry Potter books, but it's worth your time. And this production is very worth it. Uh, I did post a review on MuggleNet. Uh, we'll actually just link to that review if you want to know more about it and see it before it closes on July 23rd. Awesome. Yeah. And last announcement before we get to a little summer game here and then chapter by chapter. My Slytherin themed playlist is now available on Spotify. Eric Ooh. did one a couple months ago. That's Hufflepuff themed. Now mine is out Slytherin themed. Uh, I got a lot of good feedback. I was very pleased. I put a lot of thought into it. I created a story. It's in four acts. Act one is life as a Slytherin and how we are misunderstood baddies with songs like Being Green by Kermit the Frog and Bad (laughs) Romance by Lady (laughs) Gaga. Act two is a Slytherin looking for love. Uh, Act three. Now, this is where we get dark and deep, y'all. We are confronting our daddy issues. I'm thinking about uh, Draco and Lucius here with songs like I Just Can't Wait to Be King. It's actually (laughs) perfect for this episode, too, by the way. Yes. Good point. And uh, Daddy Lessons by Beyonce and Fortunate Son by Creative's Clearwater Revival. Mm. <laughs> and then it ends with the killing of Dumbledore. Um, and then Act 4 is maybe Sly- Slytherins are bad and we should lean into it. So Act 4 is kind of like a celebration of being bad. So I had a lot of fun creating this. Check it out now. It's on our social media channels and on Spotify. The playlist is called Sliv Life, The Sins of Somebody Else's Past, which is inspired by a Bruce Springsteen line. This goes so hard, Andrew. <laughs> this is just, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. This is great. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I feel this was very intentional. I'll be honest. I So I made the Ravenclaw playlist. I should have included Micah, to be honest with that, because I was just like, Ravenclaw common room party. We're all twerking in the Ravenclaw common room. That's that's the vibe. And then Eric was also very intentional with his Hufflepuff list. And then this, Andrew, you're it's like a rock opera. <laughs> you're telling about Slytherin. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tell the story. So check that out on our social media channels. Well, actually, breaking news. I am going to be doing a playlist. Oh, OK, good. For August. So I'm not totally left out. But good. that's, a, you know, oh, yeah, as you shouldn't have been. That's good. So Ravenclaw playlist part two. I know we have plans uh, for our Gryffindor playlist as well. There will be one. And we're working with somebody very special on it. Actually, Chloe set it up. And oh, that's right. Yes. It's uh, maybe an influencer type. Yes. Very good collab Ooh. coming there. Maybe a familiar, famous influencer type on TikTok who sounds like one of our professors. We will see. We will see. Stay tuned for that playlist and definitely check out the ones that have been released so far. Well, I thought that we would uh, get things started on this episode with a little bit of a fun segment. It's summertime now. It is the 4th of July weekend here in the U.S. And what better way to get things started than with a Wizarding World barbecue? And everybody loves a good old fashioned barbecue here in the U.S., So each host is going to pick one good and one evil character in the wizarding world (laughs) and share what they would bring to this barbecue. Are the evil characters and the good characters all at the same barbecue, Micah? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. There there's no separation. Uh, Everybody is welcome at this uh, this party. Going to be a little awkward. (laughs) Let's start with the good characters. I'll get things started and then. We'll just take it from there. So for me, I chose Luna Lovegood, and I just thought, uh, you know, she'd be out in the garden picking dirigible plums, so she would make a dirigible plum salad. She might throw a few other odds and ends into it, but uh, I feel like this would be a barbecue favorite amongst everybody. Yeah, you always need that sweet or that fruity aperitif. Yeah, well, for my good character, I chose Tonks. 
And I had some some thoughts about Tonks. This is a very intentional choice. First of all, I think that she would bring mac and cheese. Mm. We never see mac and cheese represented in the wizarding world, but her dad's a muggle. <laughs> so I have to assume that she has been introduced to the dish. Um, I think it's easy to make for the most part. And there's a very low likelihood of her clumsiness causing disaster here. Although can't guarantee what's going to happen at the barbecue. We see what happens in Order of the Phoenix when she tries to help Molly with dinner. So no guarantees there. But she would bring mac and cheese and a great attitude. (laughs) I'm a huge mac and cheese fan. So I appreciate this one. Same. Yeah. Mac and cheese is a classic July 4th staple. I chose Charlie Weasley as my good character. And I think that, you know, coming to a barbecue, I know there's um, some animal product being served at most barbecues with barbecue sauce. But Charlie Weasley would provide that much needed alternative. Charlie would bring ethically sourced beyond dragon meat burgers. So, oh my god <laughs> clever. He, I he love would bring this those, those patties they taste just like the real thing but no dragons were harmed <laughs> um, I feel like the magical the wizarding world would be able to recreate you know uh, vegan in other words like f- tastes like food options quite easily because they have those every flavor beans and if the every flavor beans are not in fact animal product then they can make that yeah that's know, a good point anyway yeah 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 it did <laughs> They make they can make any flavor possible and they pick bad flavors instead of good ones a lot of the time. <laughs> My good character is, of course, Dumbledore. We want him at the party, of course, and Dumbledore's bring in some hot dogs, but <laughs> he's going to purposely bring one less than the number of attendees that are present so people can fight over them for his own personal amusement, because as we've discussed on the show, he loves watching a mess. He loves watching some fireworks, pun not intended. We've slowly built, though, the 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 meal, right? We have a salad, yeah. we have a side, we have burgers and dogs. So th- this worked out quite well. I don't actually see a dessert on here at all. So maybe amongst the four of us, we'll need to figure out who brings that and what the dessert is. But um, switching over to the baddies, I went with Lucius Malfoy and peacock kebabs so (laughs) quite counter eric to your ethically sourced beyond dragon meat burgers lucius would definitely go out into the garden chop a few peacock head off heads off and then probably have his wife knowing him and his personality cook up the kebabs and bring them over to the barbecue I love it. Very on brand. Goalie in our chat right now is saying no one is bringing pickles. That's such a good point. True. We'll bring the pickles. Yeah, we'll bring the picks. That's on Dumbledore's list, too, to go along with the hot dogs. Yeah. The uh, what's implied here is that we're all going to be at this barbecue, too. So, you know, we don't expect wizards to fully understand all the things that should come to a barbecue. It doesn't seem like it's a thing they do. So we'll supplant Anything that's missing. Well, getting real awkward over here. Um, I picked Gellert Grindelwald uh, as my baddie to come to this barbecue. And I feel like of all these characters, he would have just like the least care or frame of reference for what is appropriate to bring to, bring to a barbecue. So I think that he would bring a chillin to sacrifice. Oh, <laughs> um, my gosh. <laughs> but when he realizes that it's hashtag awkward... He would try to pretend that he brought it as a potluck contribution and be like, hey, guys, let's kill it <laughs> and eat it. Um, and then he would get really mad when it bows to Albus, because obviously we know Ooh. it would. Um, so that would create it would create some of the drama that you expect at some big gatherings like this. You know, you you bring competing people into the fold and there's drama. There's like this undercurrent of um fireworks going off and i think that it would be uh it would be fun to watch i think dumbledore would like it (laughs) would he bow to albus or would he bow to the hot dog Ooh, that's a good (laughs) question is albus holding a hot dog because then how do you know raises a lot of questions (laughs) i can also see grindelwald transforming the killing into a pinata oh 
Yeah, I could see him doing that. This is getting sad. We can, pro- we can promise that there's no more animal death uh, from this point out. <laughs> My character uh, is Peter Pettigrew. And I tried thinking what would be the perfect dish for Peter to bring, um, seeing as how he spent the last 13 years of his life, if we're going current in the books, as a rat. I figured, oh, rats and mice like cheese. He would bring a cheese plate. But because I love cheese and I don't love Peter Pettigrew, I do have the caveat that it's not a very good cheese plate. It's maybe just all Swiss, which is really bad. That makes a lot of sense. (laughs) I think he just offended fans of Swiss cheese, though. Look, it's fine as a sometimes cheese, but it's not one of my top eight cheeses. And to round things out, so this is just me injecting my own personal wants and needs in here. Um... (laughs) Umbridge is my evil character, but she's bringing potato salad because I love potato salad as a side and I want it there. So she would put raisins in it, though. She's the type. How dare you? How dare you she ruin would. the potato tell, salad? Tell me I'm wrong. No, you're not wrong. But now you've just spoiled the potato salad I was looking forward to. She'd probably dye it pink, too. Yeah. Gross. All right. Well, that went well. Happy summer, everybody. All right, let's move to chapter by chapter. This week, we're discussing chapter 14 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Snape's Grudge. And we'll start, as always, with our seven-word summary. Listeners, it's editor Andrew jumping in for a second just to tell you, you're going to hear some of the longest gaps of silence in podcast history. I'm keeping them in intentionally, and you're about to find out why. Just please know, these gaps are intentional, and we apologize in advance. Thank you. Y'all are gonna hate me. Mud. Fines. It's... Um, recipient. (laughs) (laughs) And that's it. (laughs) That's the rule. Yeah, Yeah, that's pretty good, actually, for a forward summary. (laughs) Yeah, that's enough. Wow, Laura, you really, you really went there. Listen, I was trying to kick us, like, we were already a little bit unhinged with the barbecue discussion. I felt like I was trying to be creative about where the seven word summary was going to take us because as we know the mud in this chapter is really the thing i mean it leaves harry like i would say red-handed but mm, not right. actually brown red-handed handed. brown-handed yeah. no it leaves him in hot water yep this will be the one that we redo at the end of the book <laughs> it's actually quite accurate so i'm not sure that, <laughs> that we, need we don't to. actually need the three remaining words <laughs> Quality over quantity. Well, Andrew, you were talking earlier about daddy issues, and I think that's going to be a theme in kind of an indirect way throughout the course of this chapter. And the first main discussion uh, I titled Dad Grid uh, because Hagrid (laughs) definitely plays the role of father figure a little bit later on in this chapter. Um, But it opens up with additional security measures being put into place. This is following the attack of Ron by Sirius Black. We have security trolls that have been placed in the Gryffindor corridor. The fat lady's portrait has been restored. Sir Cadigan has been uh, given the old heave-ho. Flitwick is teaching the Hogwarts front doors how to recognize Sirius Black. Uh, That's a Quizich question alert right there. Uh, But My question is, why weren't these measures taken after the fat lady was attacked weeks, months ago at this point? These seem like pretty simple steps that could have been taken, and only now are they being put into place. I know that sounds like... Starting to sound like a security nightmare. Security nightmare. I feel like it's kind of like a maybe supply and demand thing. I, I could see the fat lady refusing to come back as we know she did. Um, and she had to be restored and everything. And then Cadogan comes in and he's a complete disaster and he's ultimately 
a piece of the puzzle when it comes to Sirius getting into Gryffindor Tower upon his second attempt. I can see Albus going to the fat lady and saying, please, can you come back? And her saying, okay, but under one condition, these are my requirements, uh, take it or leave it. (laughs) And it's unfortunate that it had to get to that point for her to make those kinds of demands. It should have been obvious. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's funny because had Sirius uh, been after Harry and he would have succeeded in killing him, there would just be a dead Harry right now. (laughs) There would just be like he got so close as to be right up to where his target was. And this is the final the measures they should have put in from day one way too late. This is the eating crow measures. This is the this is the well, we got lucky twice now, but we hope he doesn't come back measures which honestly raises the question where is the ministry in all of this this is the most sought after convict in recent memory and we don't get any inkling from anybody that the ministry is at hogwarts is talking to dumbledore is putting their own security measures in place outside of the Dementors, who, yet again, by the way, I believe this is the third time they've failed to do their job, (laughs) yet they are still (laughs) gainfully employed by both the Ministry and Hogwarts. But it just seems strange to me that they're nowhere to be found and that Dumbledore hasn't addressed the students at all. That's another great question. This time last year, they were shutting down the school because of these, you know, attacks and the students being in danger. Um, It makes me wonder if uh, Lucius Malfoy isn't so distracted with this whole Buckbeak hippogriff injured my son thing to be campaigning against Dumbledore as relentlessly as he did last year. So maybe it was all Lucius Malfoy being the driving force behind Dumbledore's expulsion last year that he's like distracted. He's not threatening the governors, but everyone should be taking more of an interest into this because this is just way out of hand right now. Maybe Dumbledore doesn't know what to say to the students and he doesn't know what to make of the serious situation. Maybe he's unsure of what's really going on himself. Well, Dumbledore should be guarding the tower. Dumbledore (laughs) should just move his offense. He also likes drama, as we've talked about. He does like drama. Uh, You know, I think, too, when it comes to the Chamber of Secrets, that's a situation where perhaps it felt like Hogwarts was sitting on this deadly secret for 50 years that they kind of just let go on and they found the right scapegoat in Hagrid um, to explain it away and make people stop asking questions. And, you know, I think Hogwarts and the Ministry would have some serious egg on their face if that truth were to come out. So maybe that explains the panic and the rush to shut the school down. Whereas Sirius Black, where where, whereas he is presumed to be very dangerous, he is one person. So it's an external threat as opposed to an internal threat in the Chamber of Secrets. To build on that, I also think there's a bit of deflection going on for Lucius in that he is directly responsible for what's happening at Hogwarts in Chamber uh, of Secrets. And there so you go. Yeah. the more that he can put the blame on Dumbledore, the better. And I'm curious too, how much at this point do the Death Eaters know about Sirius? So he could be thinking that this is a wonderful thing that the person who killed James and Lily are is is out and about and actively pursuing Harry. It's like his his dream come true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were wondering about that a few episodes ago, kind of wondering, do Voldemort's inner circle know the truth about Sirius or no? I don't think we have a clear answer to that at this point. No, I don't think we do. Yeah. But another casualty of this entire situation is Neville. And Neville really takes the fall for Hogwarts being a security nightmare. He gets detention. His Hogsmeade permission is revoked. He gets a howler from his grandmother, which is probably the worst of any of these things. And this, to me, is a bit unfair he is not told the password to get into Gryffindor Tower. So he has to stand out there and constantly be seen by his peers. And that has to be, 
I know I said the howler from his grandmother is is probably the worst. This is probably the worst punishment of anything. It, it's almost like you're you're meant to stand out in the town square and have people throw things at you. That's it's exactly meaning, it. Yeah. But they achieved the same thing. The howler and this uh, punishment as well are both public shaming. We are now getting the Gryffindors to all feel like getting Neville to feel even infinitely uh, more inferior every time. And I I guess it wouldn't be fair to just let Neville in without the password. But clearly, the fat lady knows who Neville is and probably most of the students like this whole password thing is kind of silly anyway, because, you know, all the students. I actually agree. Yeah. So so there's no reason Neville shouldn't be allowed in. OK, m- maybe the compromise is don't let him have the passwords, but just let him through the door. You know what he looks like. He's the nervous looking kid who's always forgetting stuff with the black hair. I guess that could be a bit of a security nightmare, though, because we know that people's likenesses can be impersonated. Nobody's going to impersonate Neville. They would never get through a day's <laughs> Nobody taunting. wants to be Neville. Snape is, <laughs> Snape is going to like just come at him. People are coming out of the woodwork to call him like a nerd and stuff. I, hey, yeah, they, I, they impersonated Crab and Goyle. So, yeah. Oh, that's true. I would put Neville a uh, <laughs> whole staircase above <laughs> those. Wand ID. <laughs> but then somebody could steal his wand. It, flaws everywhere. Flaws everywhere. The thing is, too, I I think that this Neville is almost a convenient scapegoat for whoever put Sir Cadigan in charge to begin with, because honestly, Neville was just doing what he had to do. Neville struggles with memory and Sir Cadigan was changing the password every other day, sometimes twice or three times a day. Neville did what he had to do in writing that list down. These circumstances were unbearable otherwise for him he needed an accommodation the fact that sir cadigan was so awful as a replacement portrait for the fat lady to guard gryffindor tower is conveniently overlooked by oh let's punish neville 10 ways to sunday like no whoever put sir cadigan in place in the first place whoever's idea this was is absolutely at fault here for the poor like consequences of what happened. And it's interesting that we don't get that teacher's name or that teacher's not being given a detention. Dumbledore. Or <laughs> it's because it's yeah. It just it got Dumbledore who's not speaking to the students also just gets off scot free for this poor abysmal decision. I think Dumbledore, if it was him, should be removed just for thinking that Sir Cadigan would be a good replacement. <laughs> Dumbledore loves mess. <laughs> he does. I love he really this, does. this theme that we're on ever <laughs> since the July 4th thing. Yeah. Drama queen Dumbledore. If you were to look at the Marauders map, he would just be sitting in his office with his feet up, sipping on some whatever he likes to drink sweet and tea. watch. Yeah, it's watching it all unfold. But yeah, th- this is uh, this is tough. And and I. I don't think I remember just how bad Neville gets treated through these first couple of books now that we're going chapter by chapter and, and reading through. But he he's really the one who takes the fall for Hogwarts just not having its bleep together. And um, even the trolls are are leering at him, you know, like... It, He's already nervous. Imagine what it's like for him to be standing there and these trolls are like looking over in his direction. I'm sure he's uh, just, he's not having a good time. You know who else isn't having a good time? Who? Quite a few people. (laughs) But uh, Hagrid, he reaches out to Harry and uh, it's very much a, uh, if I can borrow this term, a come to Jesus type of conversation uh, that he has with, with Harry and Ron And I think Hagrid gives his best lesson of the year, but it's not in care of magical creatures. It's in friendship. (laughs) We see a totally different side of Hagrid here, right? This is, this is great. Honestly. Dadgrid. Dadgrid. It's Dadgrid. Yeah. Nobody else can talk to Harry and Ron the way that Hagrid can talk to Harry and Ron. And he doesn't use this or abuse this power at all ever. He he has his piece to say. He says, listen, you guys should be better friends to Hermione. And it's such a uh, a truth bomb for it's um, how unusual it is for him to even say this. That makes it more powerful. The fact that he never pulls this card. Right. And Harry realizes 
a number of things during this conversation, but first and foremost, that he's let both Hagrid and Buckbeak down. So despite all that Hermione had going on, she still found the time to help Hagrid with his case. And we know that they're going to be going down uh, to the ministry shortly for Buckbeak's trial. But Harry really, and, and this is a theme throughout this chapter, right, of letting people down. And Harry really has a moment where he says, look, like, I have not been a good friend to Hagrid in this moment. I said I was going to help him put together this case in defense of Buckbeak, and I dropped the ball yeah. completely. This is an interesting scene because Harry does have a lot going on, but I think it's a good reminder. And, you know, this is something when you read when you're older, you're you're thinking about it differently. Like it's hard to manage friendships and relationships throughout your life because you have stuff going on and they can accidentally fall by the wayside. I think like people our age here quite often, um, you know, from other people or we hear it in our own heads, like it's hard to make friends, new friends at our at our age. And it's because everybody's so busy and and it's difficult to balance all the friendships that you might have. Or if you're trying to seek out new friendships, starting those new friendships and then maintaining them on top of everything else you have going on in your life. So I don't you know, Harry's realizing that he could have been a better friend, but also this is something that I think happens to all of us. This is a good life lesson and reminder of that balancing everything is hard. Yeah. I highly recommend um, if you are looking for a way to stay in touch with your friends on a regular basis, start a podcast, uh, <laughs> do, we- do weekly releases, like get on a schedule and, uh, you know, have that commitment that you're required to make and and that's how you get it done. But I think to Hagrid's credit here, he recognizes that Harry has a lot going on. Not only does Harry have a lot going on, he's also a child. So I think Hagrid in this moment recognizes, you know, whatever help he can get from the trio is great but he's not necessarily expecting it from them because they're children, they're students. And he was more giving Harry a reminder that, yeah, Hermione has a lot going on too, but she still found time for me. Not saying that I blame you for not having time for me. You've had a lot going on. But I think that's Hagrid speaking to the caliber of friend that Hermione is and trying to highlight for Harry and Ron what it is they're passing up in this moment by continuing to hold a grudge against her. That's a great way of saying it. I think it's that's exactly right. And Hagrid has been watching Harry practice. Hagrid's been seeing mm-hmm. it happen. He knows Harry's been busy. He's not saying any of this for that reason. It's not about him. It's about Hermione. It's about Mm -hmm. trying to advocate for somebody who they're cross with. And Ron is even more hesitant to like Harry. They both feel bad. They're both being, you know, kind of low key shamed by by a teacher. And do they, though? Let's talk about the difference between the two, because I feel like Harry realizes that he has been a horrible friend to Hermione. This is after Hagrid talks about how Hermione showed up at his hut in tears about the fireball then about the scabber situation, then Ron almost getting attacked by Sirius Black. So clearly this is having a major impact on her. I feel like Ron still needs some time to get there, but Harry is pretty quick to pick up on what's going on. Um, So there's still very much a difference here uh, between the two in terms of how they react. Yeah, I I just know that they succeed in exchanging uncomfortable looks. It's nice to get a talking to like this is Hagrid's bravery uh, to come. I mean, if if Harry and Ron, I know he doesn't need their help with the trial, but if they had just up stopped talking to him, he would be really upset. I think he is putting his friendship a little bit at risk with them, but he's braving through it to do the greater good. I think it's a very Gryffindor moment for Hagrid. Part of it too is probably that Hagrid himself doesn't have many friends. So when he sees this going on, he's trying to rectify the situation. But uh, speaking of that, Laura, I know that you said that Hagrid maybe doesn't do enough to push Ron in the direction that he needs to go 
in in this particular situation. Yeah, well, and I think it's because Hagrid's he's empathizing with Hermione because this is something he shares with her when he says, you know, listen, Ron, you know, Hermione's cat behaved like all cats do. And Ron was like, yeah, but she just won't admit it. We got to the crux of the issue there. She just won't admit that she's wrong. She won't admit that he did it. And Hagrid's like, ah, yeah, people can be a bit stupid about their pets, which very apropos coming from Hagrid. Um, that's very on oh, brand he's so for him. wise. So yeah. all this wisdom, Hagrid. And I loved how as he says this, it's noted that he says it wisely as Buckbeak spits ferret bones onto his pillow in the background. The sass level of these non-human beings. I know. So, I mean, I feel like that just really sets the stage for explaining why Hagrid maybe has a little more empathy for Hermione here. And I will say, in Ron's defense, Hagrid is more likely to defend Hermione because of that, because of the empathy he shares with her in his own um, sort of disregard for the dangers that certain animals can pose, but also because she's helping him in response to his own blind spots about those creatures. Agreed. I mean, honestly, him introducing hippogriffs to a class of third years was a mistake. He still doesn't even really see it as a mistake. And Hermione is helping him through that situation. So I think this is a it's a special bonding moment for Hagrid and Hermione. I think we can see some similarities in the way that Hagrid views Buckbeak and whether he was appropriately introduced to a class of third years and the way Hermione views Crookshanks and how, you know, quote, severe Crookshanks uh, grudge or Crookshanks having it out for Scabbers is. She doesn't think it's that big of a deal, just like Hagrid didn't think the hippogriffs were that big of a deal. So then the question would be, how do we feel about Hermione now after having gone through this entire conversation with Hagrid and Ron and Hermione. Do we agree that her threat to turn the map in should Harry sneak out to Hogsmeade yet again? Is that the right decision? And hasn't enough happened at this point that Harry should really be listening to her? Like th This is literally, what, days after Sirius has gone into the Gryffindor common room and tried to presumably attack him but got Ron instead, he is all about hopping into the One-Eyed Witch and going to Hogsmeade and hanging out with Ron. It's reckless. And I actually, I side with Hermione here. I, I, I don't know if you go as far as to turn the map in, but there's probably another way to go about it. She could have said, I, I think Harry is going to be trying to get to Hogsmeade again. It is so funny because last year or last episode, we were all like, yes, we side with Ron. All four of us unanimously were like, Ron is right. Hermione is wrong. But, you know, circumstances can change. New information can come to light. And I think that, yes, this Hogsmeade weekend is reckless. And I think that this chapter shows to illustrate that Hermione is not 100% wrong uh, because of all the trouble that Harry gets in. And he does eventually feel bad about it yeah he could have skipped a weekend i mean Sirius black really did come in their their tower and it's all about harry here it's all about how he'll never ever go to hogsmeade ever again if he doesn't go this weekend and it's like look dude sit down and yeah listen to hermione have a seat right over yeah there. i think this shows that hermione is a better big picture thinker than harry and ron are um and that maybe she sometimes struggles when she gets in the weeds. So I think that's particularly evident when it comes to the Kirkshanks and Scabbers debate that's happening. I think she is wrong about that. She's too close to it. It's her cat, right? So she wants to be defensive of it. But when she's thinking about the total landscape of Harry having this map that shows secret passages to get into Hogwarts, that in and of itself is a liability if somebody else were to find it. The fact that Harry isn't supposed to be leaving the grounds because there's literally a murderer looking for him 
as far as everyone knows. She also has the knowledge that their professor is a werewolf. She just has, I think, a much better overall perspective and understanding of what the landscape looks like and how dangerous it is for Harry. She also knows Harry, so she knows that it's not just Harry going to Hogsmeade, it's Harry going to Hogsmeade and then proceeding to take additional unnecessary risks, like trying to prank Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, and ultimately having his invisibility cloak ripped off of him and revealing that he was somewhere he wasn't supposed to be. She was right. Her execution's bad. Yeah, the the way that she goes about it in saying I'm going to tell on you yeah. is not the way you do it. That's not how you convince your friends. Yeah, at this point though, I mean, she's so pissed off with them probably too that that's her only option. Continuing the theme of daddies uh, in this uh, discussion, this <laughs> this next main discussion is going to be focused on Snape's daddy issues. And when I say daddy, I'm talking about James Potter. Although I'm sure we can jump into Tobias Snape and his relationship with his son at a later point. So we just talked about how Harry cannot go to Hogsmeade. And he's walking around. He's trying to actually actively get to Hogsmeade. But Neville shows up. And (laughs) poor Neville. Um, And then Snape shows up. And, you know, Snape just really continues to actively look for opportunities to bully Harry. Here's my first question. Why can't Harry and Neville be walking around the castle while the other students are off in Hogsmeade? There's really nothing for them to be doing, right? Like, right. let's say, Andrew, you and I were walking around the castle. Should a professor stop us and say, hey, what the hell are you two doing? You should be off in your common room. You know, it's just... I, Snape is just you can go for an innocent walk. Maybe you and I just want to get our steps in for the day and we're not allowed exactly. to go outside to because minds. of serious rights. Walks are healthy. So, yes, it's just Snape. Another example of him bullying and, and being unnecessarily cruel. Yeah. And I think part of it is Harry's failing because he can. He has such a guilty face uh, immediately. He cannot hide his guilt to save his life. So it's something about Harry about to like go behind the statue of the one-eyed witch and like throw his bag down and all of a sudden yeah. Snape comes. Snape really does catch him doing something very mysterious. That is so true. It's... He is not just up to something innocent right now. He's not going yeah. for his mindfulness walk. <laughs> he's trying to sneak yeah. out. <laughs> Can you imagine if there was that terminology like back in the night? Like, Harry's, oh, I'm just going on my mindfulness walk, Professor. You know, kind he's of wearing a Fitbit, he... trying to hit 10,000 yeah. steps for the day. Yeah. Oh, man. And I will talk about this in a minute, I think. But I think we're led to believe that Snape already has his suspicions about the statue of the one eyed witch. Yes, because, er, well, he. Is it in this scene that we're discussing or earlier in the chapter? He's looking at this witch and trying to figure out what's up with it he knows something is up with it yeah and i i think we can talk about it later when snape gets the map but it it does raise the question how much does snape know about this and what the marauders were up to Mm. right yeah it's a big ongoing question i think Mm -hmm. i feel like he's maybe putting two and two together here yes yeah definitely that's what's going on i I think we see it it might be through the map, him kind of playing around in that area. And then he goes back to his office when Harry's up in Gryffindor Tower and then Harry sneaks back down and through the one eyed witch. And we'll pause on everything that goes down when Harry is in Hogsmeade, because I wanted to ask. Harry comes back from Hogsmeade after the incident with Draco. And I'm. I know there's probably a million things running through his mind, but why not just wait in, in, in the bottom of the passageway, you have the map for Snape to completely clear the area before you jump out. And I know he's, he's very much like on edge because he thinks Draco is going to get back before him and he's going to get in trouble. But 
I think Harry almost implicates himself here. Yeah, he really does. I think so too. I was thinking the same thing. Um, my approach would have been to get back again, observe the map, wait to see that Snape is gone, put on the invisibility cloak again, sneak back to Gryffindor Tower, and go to bed and act like I was taking a nap all afternoon. Because truth be told, Snape has zero proof that Harry was in Hogsmeade. It's just this wild story that Draco came back with. I think that Draco is less likely to, I don't know, it's hard to accuse somebody of who who like faked an injury for three months of being like the most truthful, honest student who would never lie about something like this. But Malfoy is covered in mud. He comes back. Like, I think, I think even though Snape is predisposed to believe Malfoy on anything, there's an air of truth. Something rings true about what, what Draco says, not just because we know it's true, but the urgency with which Draco wants to catch Harry in the act, there's this constant struggle here of like Draco always trying to like get Hagrid in trouble. And there's this time uh, crunch on it. Something about the urgency would have tipped Snape off that this was real. Yeah. And, you know, pointing out that Kyle in the discord is also observing as, you know, a further matter of Harry implicating himself. He comes back, he's sweaty and he's covered in mud. Um, and he tries to play dumb with Snape, which obviously isn't going to work. Yeah. I, I mean, if Hermione was there, probably would have come up with some really good excuse that would have worked well. But Harry in this moment just really can't think on his feet. And Snape straight out asks him, can anyone confirm you weren't in Gryffindor Tower? And my response is, can anyone confirm he wasn't? (laughs) If I were Harry, I would just walk away. Like Snape doesn't have anything on Harry here to really like cause suspicion. Like, sure, if he wants to go and investigate the one-eyed witch a little bit more, let him do it. Right? No problem. Yeah. Maybe kind of just panicking in the moment. He's afraid Snape might dock some points from Gryffindor. So, and obviously he continues to just like really hate Snape. So he wants the fight to some extent. He wants to prove them wrong in the moment. He wants to get them. And like yeah. Snape wants to get Harry. It's a vicious yeah. s- cycle yeah. circle. Right. And Snape is presented with the perfect opportunity to get Harry to rise. Right. He brings up James. He starts insulting Harry's father and Harry takes the bait. Yeah, that's it's a very disgusting moment between Snape and Harry, I think. Uh, Before we get there, I wanted to talk a little bit about we know that Snape has the ability to read minds. And so I'm wondering if in the moment where both in the moment where he catches Harry outside of the One-Eyed Witch before he goes to Hogsmeade and after he goes to Hogsmeade, is he actively reading Harry's mind? Um, I know we'll talk a lot more about this in Order of the Phoenix, but in Order of the Phoenix, Snape is given the permission to penetrate Harry's mind. In these moments, you would say that he's doing it by force and without permission and we've we've literally had references in prior books where harry has actually straight out said it was almost as if snape could read his mind yeah. and so I, I know some folks may feel differently here they may just feel like you know snape can tell what's up he's a teacher he's been a teacher for a little bit but uh, and so there is something to that he's also an adult harry is not but I'm wondering, could it be a bit of both? If you're around kids, you're being lied to and you know it. Like you kind of can sense when students aren't being 100% honest with you. And it happens often enough that I think over the years that Snape has been te- uh, teaching, he would get uh, sort of that sixth sense developed. He's more predisposed to believe Harry is lying. But still, I think I think he can tell. It may be a situation that J.K. Rowling hadn't quite figured out how legitimacy would work or how the mind reading would work because I think the way it's laid out in book five, it's a very specific, you are being shown what it is that you are revealing to somebody that is reading your mind. 
uh, and casting legitimates. And that's a lot different altogether than some of this early book stuff where Harry has the feeling that Dumbledore or Snape is like searching his mind for something. It may be that they can tell emotions more so than specific moments or thoughts. Maybe that's what Snape is doing here. But all he would read is guilt because Harry is guilty AF. He did the crime. Yeah. Harry's also just not a good liar. I mean, we see this multiple times, but this is particularly evident. I mean, he's showing physical, he's presenting physical symptoms of lying. He doesn't have a good story in place. Um, Honestly, I feel like Ron uh, kind of entering the scene towards the end of the chapter offers further discredit to anything Harry is trying to do to establish innocence. Um, So yeah, he's just, he's not doing a good job here. And even if Snape isn't using legitimacy at all here, I think it's pretty clear Harry's lying. But I agree that especially early on in the books, it's, it's a little vague. It's a little murky. We don't know when or how much Snape would have begun using this. And another thing I think of too is like, well, why can't they just get a pensive memory, right? Uh, Why can't Snape demand that Harry produce a memory of the last two hours? And I also think, well, maybe the pensive hadn't been invented yet. Maybe Veritas Serum, huge in the next book at the end hadn't been invented yet. And I and rightly so, it's a crime to force someone to use Veritaserum to account for their whereabouts. Maybe they have the the right not to tell you the truth legally, but it there are other ways in which Snape could have verified uh what Snape or what Harry is is saying here. And and I'm I guess I'm grateful that not until book five when Snape is commanded to use Veritaserum on Harry uh by Umbridge does any and you know he's like they treat it with the level of seriousness that it deserves. But there were other ways for Snape to find out here, especially like I'm just surprised Harry gets away from here with his life. Honestly, a pensive would have been extreme, though, for this. He doesn't have any yeah. any evidence. The other thing just to keep in mind here, too, we don't know necessarily this to be true, but Snape could have been put on Harry as a tail from Dumbledore, mm-hmm. meaning he could have instructed Snape to keep a close eye on Harry given everything that's been going on. And maybe that's part of the reason why he's showing up where Harry's showing up all the time. Just looking for a reason to blame Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, you know, when it comes to, you know, questions about why not use a pensive, why not use Veritas Serum? I feel like Snape, um, it is in his character to not immediately jump to using those tools because he wants to prove that he's right. He wants to prove that his perceptions and inclinations about Harry are the right ones. He knows, he believes that he knows that Harry is just a carbon copy of James. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't need anything to prove that. Yeah, well, okay. In in the next book, though, he kind of gets uh, that thrown back in his face where he suspects Harry of the polyjuice potion. And it is, in fact, not Harry Right. But let's, um, Laura, going back to something you were talking about a little bit earlier, connecting the threads here between Order of the Phoenix and Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, Snape's Worst Memory, the chapter that reveals a lot uh, in Order of the Phoenix, is really an extension of Snape's grudge, this chapter here in Prisoner of Azkaban. uh, You know, a lot of the same... Um, even things that are taking place, right? Harry coming down to Snape's office and there's really a heated conversation that goes on here between the two of them. And I just want us to keep in mind that this is a teacher talking to a student. We were actually able to get the audio straight from when this happened many, many years ago. Oh, wow. The first piece of this conversation here is actually you're hearing it from inside Harry's head. Uh, so can we go and and play the uh, the tape from yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Famous Harry Potter is a lawn to himself. Let the ordinary people worry about his safety. Famous Harry Potter goes where he wants to with no thoughts for consequences. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yikes. So that, that's that's what Harry was thinking as Snape was talking to him. 
Uh, and then <laughs> the, <laughs> these next two are actually directly from Snape himself. How extraordinarily like your father you are, Potter. He too was exceedingly arrogant. A small amount of talent on the Quidditch pitch made him think he was a cut above the rest too. Strutting around the place with his friends and admirers, the resemblance between you two is uncanny. Creepy. <laughs> Micah, are these you or what what was this? He texted me these this morning. Yeah, I just I use some voice app and there's oh. a bunch of different options that you can select. So so this actually is you speaking. Interesting. It is me. Yeah, it's just adjusted slightly. Yeah, no, I like the Snape interpretation. We, we, we have one more authentic tape from 30 years ago. Not not from an app this morning. <laughs> Your father didn't set much store by the rules either. Rules were for lesser mortals, not Quidditch Cup winners. His head was so swollen. Thank you, Lucifer. <laughs> Imagine holding a grudge this long. Like, I think we were, we all experienced bullying when we were in school. Oh, yeah. You know, but dang, man. And then taking it out on a kid, it's, it's rough. Um, Snape also adds some more context in this conversation to the story Dumbledore told Harry about James saving Snape's life. And it doesn't paint James in the best light. I think this is the beginning of sowing the seeds of doubt in Harry's mind about what kind of person his father was. At this stage, he's not really predisposed to believe it. But he's going to get confirmation in a couple years that what Snape's telling him here is true. Well, Harry has that moment where he thinks that he can throw this all back into Snape's face when he reveals that he knows that James saved Snape's life. Yeah. And then Snape says, oh, but you don't know the entirety of it all, to your point, Laura. And mm -hmm. and But that initial moment, I mean, we're told like Snape's face goes completely white when when this information is is revealed but somehow some way snape still seems to have the upper hand but what what i really have an issue with here though is this is an adult talking to a 13 year old child and clearly he has issues with james and he's taking them out on harry for absolutely no reason at all there's one little moment where I feel bad for Snape in this chapter, and it is the when Harry throws that in his face of my father saved your life. What he says in the same sentence is Dumbledore told me. And it just like pulls the rug out from under like Snape doesn't miss a beat, thank God. But like, how weird must it be for your boss to have confided in this child when he was 11? This gotcha moment that's like this, this whole, um, you know, thing that that will put Snape as a, at a disadvantage if it's known. And Dumbledore is just casually throwing this out. We know this context and the circumstances, but really it's like the reason Dumbledore really told Harry is to cover up for the, why can't I be touched by Voldemort kind of thing. And he's like the, he's just trying to like side eye the protection and why does Snape hate him? Well, the, but the reality is Dumbledore gave Harry this ammo against one of his teachers. And that was a bad decision in the moment. And how must it feel to be Snape? No, it's it's a great point, Eric, because it probably raises the question for Snape in this moment. What else did Dumbledore tell Harry? That's exactly it. Right? Because Snape is, you know, he's doing his part to, quote, keep Harry safe. There's a comparison we can make to the Dursleys here and saying, yeah, Snape technically checked the box of keeping Harry safe, but he you know, certainly didn't keep him psychologically safe, um, for sure. But he has to be wondering, you know, the one thing that I asked Dumbledore, no one can know that I'm doing this for Harry. Did he tell him? Is Harry ever going to find out? How much does Harry know? It could have easily been that at the end of year one, Harry's like, I thought Snape was the bad guy for a real long time there. And Dumbledore's like, ah, don't worry, he loved your mother. <laughs> you're you're fine. You're protected the next seven years, son. Don't worry about it. He was in love with your mother. Like, could have easily said that, and it blows the whole series. But like, it, what Snape doesn't know what Dumbledore told him. So I think that that provides a little bit more fuel and for for Snape to be even angrier, even more 
kind of reckless here uh, with Harry is that Harry tried to do this, tried to stand up and and provide this gotcha, and it didn't there, work. There's there's also a, a bit of a theme of jealousy that runs through a lot of what Snape says. Just looking at parts of these quotes, a small amount of talent on the Quidditch pitch. We know mm-hmm. that James was definitely not just able of showcasing a small amount of talent. He was really effing good. Um, strutting around the place, you know, friends and admirers, you know, calling him a Quidditch Cup winner. Rules were for lesser mortals. I just feel like Snape actually really wants to be James. And that's probably oh, a whole yeah. other conversation, mm-hmm. but uh, worth calling out. Now, one moment where we could look at Snape either reading Harry's mind or just knowing that something is up is when he asks him to turn out his pockets. Uh, and of course, he comes across the Marauders map. And not long after that, Snape reaches out through the fire to Lupin after being insulted by the map and uh, (laughs) tells Harry that he thought perhaps he got it directly from its manufacturers. And I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about this because there, there's clearly an existing relationship between Snape and the map. I'm not sure that Snape has ever seen the map before, but, Certainly seeing those names pop up, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs probably is a bit of um, a trigger for him. And so if he doesn't know exactly what the map is, he knows who created it. And yeah, it's uh, it should be a clear um, signal for us that when he reaches out to Lupin, that Lupin has a direct tie to this map as well. Yeah. I I love this scene. I love that when Lupin and Snape are discussing it, they're kind of talking around the truth. Uh, So Harry isn't really clued in on what is actually going on beneath the surface. But yeah, I think um, Snape definitely knows who these people are. I think it between Snape being triggered by the, the memories that Harry's face and presence bring back for him you know with lily and james to the point about quidditch um and the map this must be a very agonizing moment for snape the marauders james harry lily like all flooding back you know i'm actually kind of impressed that snape didn't just outright start sharing details about what's going on here because he must be so angry and triggered in this moment well, and I think the question for me is how much does he know about Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs? Um, we know that the uh, Marauders were not shy about using those nicknames that they had for one another um, out in public. Uh, Harry is like a little bit away from them when they're hanging out on the grounds during Snape's worst memory. And they're like, oh, actively calling each other by these names. Yeah. I don't think Snape is close enough to fully know them or remember them fully, though, at this moment. Um, so when he he sees those names, they're familiar and I, and it's just weird because the, maybe he got it directly from the manufacturers, um, doesn't ring to me as being Snape saying, did you give him this parchment? Um, so it's not like a direct accusation, but the names do sound familiar enough, I think to him. Mm -hmm. Well, Well, and if nothing else, I think the tone and the insults that they're throwing at him are recognizable. Um, again, I think he's putting two and two together here, but it is a great question. We've got several folks in the discord asking the same thing. Does Snape directly know about these nicknames? Does he remember them from when they were in school? I I feel like from reading this, we're led to imply the answer to that or led to infer that the answer to that is yes. I think so too. Calling Lupin Um, directly, the manufacturers... Yeah, I do find it interesting, though, that Snape confronted Lupin with this instead of going to Dumbledore, based on the fact that earlier in the book, he shared his suspicions with Dumbledore that he believed someone inside the castle, aka Lupin, was helping Sirius get in. I find it curious that he 
if he still holds this belief that he confronted Lupin directly and didn't take it straight to Dumbledore. So I don't know if that means that at this point, Snape isn't suspecting Lupin Mm. or if he's just trying to maybe do a bit of a power play because he knows Lupin obviously wouldn't want knowledge of the map getting back to Dumbledore. Yeah, this works on many levels. I can just appreciate how Lupin random Saturday just gets called down to Snape's office, has to burst in through the flames and go, all right, what's up? And have to like all the layers here of protecting Harry, being disappointed in Harry, preventing Snape from knowing the full story, Lupin himself not knowing the full story behind the map. It's working on all of these levels. I think this is why we love Lupin is his ability. Like when he's not being completely subdued by the werewolf thing, uh, and his illness, he can operate on so many cylinders and and he ultimately he's the one that's that has the the right sort of morality here. Not Snape, not Harry. They just want to get at each other. But Lupin really wants to protect Harry. Yeah, he's very quick on his feet in in finding the right way to cover for Harry. But I think much like in the beginning of the chapter, we're faced with a moment for Harry where he feels as if he's let someone else down that he really cares about, right? Going back to Hagrid at the start of the chapter, and then of course, Hermione, not long after that, he's now feeling really, really bad for putting Lupin in this situation. And it's it's even noted, he feels worse than at any point in Snape's office. So despite everything that was going on between him and Snape in that entire conversation where they were going at each other, he feels worse having had that conversation outside of Snape's office with Lupin and really letting him down. Because this is a person who has believed so much in him throughout the course of this book. And now it's like, oh, you know, like it's just a sigh of disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. And we've all been there. Oh, yeah. It feels horrible to let somebody down in that way. Yeah, the feeling that you let somebody you care about down. Yeah, or or were extra risky. Like, you were risky for you, but you didn't think about the implications of others, you know, what Mm. others might be dragged down into your web. You know, I think, too, for those of us paying attention, we now have all the puzzle pieces to figure out who and what the Marauders were, um, specifically because of Lupin and Harry's conversation about the map, the way that Lupin is even, like, he characterizes what the Marauders would want. He's like, oh, the the makers of this map uh, would want to lead you out of the school. And Harry's like, you know them? And Lupin's like, we've met. And it's just like that confirmation there, in addition to I was friends with James, and in addition to McGonagall going, James and Sirius, best buds, you never saw one without the other. All the pieces are now finally here to be like, okay, Harry's dad was friends with Sirius Black, And by extension, Peter Pettigrew and Remus Lupin, they created the Marauders map. There's four, four, four. You can just add it all up finally now if you were the most astute reader. Yeah. But not not before. Well, you also have a really good point here about where the map was located and the fact that Lupin knew where it was. That's the other thing is what circumstances would Lupin have allowed or the Marauders have just allowed Filch to keep the map? Like they didn't need any more. They already found all the passageways. But what good is it doing um, sitting in, in in Filch's office, just languishing in a file cabinet? What what were the circumstances, I want to know, that they just left it there, that Filch got it, and they were like, this is not worth enough of our energy to get back? I could almost see them leaving it there, believing that that's probably the safest place for it to be. Like yeah. maybe they left it there at the end of their time at Hogwarts. Right. Who's to say that Filch actually confiscated it? Mm. True. And I can also see them taking a very similar stance to the one Fred and George take, where they say, hey, we know this map inside and out, so it really doesn't matter if it's been confiscated. We have all of this information mental mapped, so we don't really need it anymore. Yeah. But I mean, why don't they give it to like uh, their kids? Right. Like, uh, so, so, so James is planning to pass the invisibility cloak on to Harry, like his father before him, his father before him. One of them should have taken the map to give to their kids 
for Hogwarts, like letting it just be confiscated in a place where a student really wouldn't realistically find it. Fred and George are an exception, but I don't think anyone would ever have found it in one of those filing cabinets if it if it weren't Fred and George. I guess the I guess the timing would depend too. We know that probably around the time this map would have been confiscated, things were really ramping up with the first wizarding war. So people just might have had other priorities in mind. Yeah. And they could have said, well, you know, we know the map, so we don't need the physical map anymore. We've got this. We need to focus on, you know, stopping Voldemort's rise to power and not necessarily focus on getting this map back. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, it's worth mentioning in the Discord, JY said that... um Per Potter, no more. The map was confiscated in the Marauders' final year, so they decided to leave it behind. So yeah, there's... there you go. I mean, it's password protected. It's just like seems like a waste <laughs> yeah. for all that magic. Filch can't use it. <laughs> no, Filch yeah. will never figure it out. That's kind of it, though. Is like they would have maybe preferred somebody, some mischief maker, do it. Yeah, yeah. About to wrap up the chapter here, but it's worth noting now that for Harry, he's kind of been depantsed a bit, right? Because he doesn't have the invisibility cloak. He doesn't have the Marauder's map. So he's really- Back to basics. Back to basics. It's like level one, starting off in Tears of the Kingdom with nothing but your uh, loincloth, essentially. Crappy stick and <laughs> pot lid. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely so, pre-patch Harry. Exactly. Uh, but the chapter does wrap up with Hermione letting Ron and Harry know that Buckbeak has been sentenced to die. So cheery end to the chapter. And now his priorities are going to be rejiggered. I love that word. <laughs> okay, let's look at some odds and ends now from the chapter. Yeah. So uh, beginning of the chapter, we're told that Sirius Black had a knife while standing over Ron, we know that this is most likely the same knife that he gives to Harry for Christmas in Goblet of Fire. Good shout this out. My mind. Oh, good catch. Ryan, hey, remember remember that good time when I snuck into the dormitory <laughs> and wielded a knife? Here you go. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Ron also estimates it was 12 inches. There's another 12. Just wanted to oh. shout that out. That's a great catch, right? Did anybody else that's notice a, the number 12? Awesome, 12, like 12 Grimald Place. It. I love how you're on. Is my Bob shaking? Top of hot dogs <laughs> and 12 inch knives. <laughs> like 12, 12, Leave me alone. 12 uses of dragon's blood. Uh, uh, Ron's popularity after getting attacked by Sirius is a precursor to the popularity he gains in Order of the Phoenix for the whole Weasley is our king campaign. Yeah, this connection really reminds me of how Ron views glory going all the way back to the Mirror of Erised when he's Quidditch captain and he's like the talk of the school. Ron relishes it, but he also kind of, because that's the way Ron thinks, that's why he gets so upset with Harry when Harry's name comes out of the Goblet of Fire, because he just assumes, I guess, up to this point, despite any evidence to the contrary, that Harry's mind must work the same exact way where all glory is good. And so that's why he suspects Harry of doing that, because it is something that Ron, if he could have figured out, would have done also because Ron likes the attention. Yeah, very true. A lot of deep seated insecurity there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This one was kind of odd to me, and I thought I'd call it out. <laughs> uh, when Snape finally gets the map to react to him, it's because he refers to himself as master of the school. <laughs> I think he's just and getting I'm, desperate. I, <laughs> yeah, or was it a, a nod to Deathly Hallows? Yeah, I, I think wow. he's just really angry, and he's trying to assert authority. So he's saying, I'm the master, master of the school. Of the yeah, like I command you yeah, as yeah. the master kind of a thing. That's I, definitely I one of the odds of the odds and ends. <laughs> it is. I think it also speaks to the way Snape, Snape sees himself. You know, he clearly questions Dumbledore throughout this book and throughout the series. He questions his judgment very often. He questions the qualifications of his colleagues I think that he thinks he's a cut above the rest, which is very interesting, given what he has to say about James in this chapter. And then final odd and end. Uh, we can't talk about this chapter without talking about the Shrieking Shack. 
and it does make an appearance. And Ron is actually quite vulnerable when he's just kind of standing out there by himself, admiring the Shrieking Shack. I mean, I didn't think about this before, but you know, he's he's the one ultimately that Sirius has been pursuing, not Harry. Mm-hmm. So for him to just be standing out in Hogsmeade by himself, looking forlornly at the, the Shrieking Shack, <laughs> is is not a good position for him to be in. And and I guess he's lucky Draco shows up when he does. We'll have more talk about the Shrieking Shack, I know, later and how it became, quote, the most haunted dwelling in Britain. But right now it serves to be a good kind of joke to play on Malfoy with, oh, this place is haunted, isn't it? But yeah, Ron hasn't made that connection that he's been the target or that he's or even that he's been so close to the real harm so far. I mean, his rat is gone. He's had a murderer over him and he doesn't. Ron doesn't feel nervous about going into Hogsmeade, even though I think enough has happened to Ron in this book that he maybe should. Let's hand out our MVP of the week awards. I'm going to give it to Micah's favorite character, Lupin, for successfully preventing Harry from hearing the truth about the Marauders and his quick thinking in front of Snape. I was impressed. Definitely. Definitely. I'm going to give it to Hagrid for not blaming Harry about getting busy with Quidditch. He understands. He just wants Harry to do better. I'm going to give it to the one-eyed witch for successfully bleep blocking Snape. And I'm going to give it to Hermione. We don't see a lot of her in this chapter. And she's definitely been wrong about Crookshanks, but she's a good friend in this chapter. So I'm going to give it to her. All right. If you have any feedback about today's episode or the chapters ahead, you can send an owl to mugglecast at gmail.com or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also send a voice message. Just record it using the voice memo app on your phone and then email us that file. Or you can use our phone number, which is 1-920-3-MUGGLE. That's 1-920-368-4453. And we do have a Muggle Mail episode on the docket for later this month. Also, if you have any fan fiction recommendations for the host to read, DM us on social. We're going to be doing a round of social media posts later this year in which we're reading and recommending different fan fictions. So we'd love to hear from listeners what fan fictions you think we should read. So go to MuggleCast on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. And send us a message with your Rex, and one of the four hosts might read that fan fiction, and we'll discuss it later in the year. Next week, we'll discuss chapter 15 of Prisoner of Azkaban. So get reading. And now it's time for Quizage. Last week's question What does Flitwick do to the front doors of Hogwarts? That's right. He teaches them to recognize a picture of Sirius Black. Don't know how that works, but it's better than nothing. Um, Here are the here are the correct answers were submitted by uh, Bagels for Buckbeak, Blerius Sack, Braylon, Buff Daddy, Harry and Cho Forever. My Animagus is a Bumblebee. Let the Dark Lord of the Dark Lands come forth. Runal Waslip, a Smoot car actor. Sir King of Kings, sneaking into Hogsmeade for a nose-biting teacup, and the Weasley Clock. Congratulations to everybody. Here is next week's Quizage question. Which class with the Gryffindors does Hermione forget to attend? Uh-oh, the facade is cracking. Uh-oh. Submit your answer to us on the Quizage form, mugglecast.com slash Quizage, or go to the main nav and click Quizage from the MuggleCast website. And just a reminder that Eric, Chloe, and I will be at LeakyCon 2023 in Chicago this summer, August 4th through the 6th. Listeners interested in registering for the con can visit LeakyCon.com and enter code MUGGLE during checkout for a 10% discount. And uh, we do have an update on our panels, right, Eric? 
that we will be speaking at. We can probably just name a few of them and then we can come back and give more information in upcoming episodes. Yeah, I, I think that's safe to say that one or both of us will be represented on the following really exciting panels. I have to breathe in like this. I'm reading Andrew's theme park ride. Uh, <laughs> Percy Jackson is Greek Harry Potter, which is British Star Wars, which is Space Narnia. That's a panel about the Greek uh, or the hero's journey. And uh, Mundane or Miracle, the Morality of Magic. Really good stuff. Those are the two big ones. MuggleCast live show, of course. There's going to be a few podcaster panels, creator panels, and uh, a very exciting game panel, which we'll mention at a later date. But we do finally have the names and the descriptors and uh, soon the time and date of some of those panels. Going to be a lot of fun. And additionally, we're going to be hosting a MuggleCast meetup for anybody in the Chicago area. You don't have to be attending the con to show up. So more details to follow there as well. And uh, hopefully we'll record a couple of these things you guys are talking about and we'll get them into the feeds or maybe elsewhere. Definitely in the live muggle cast at the least. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, looking forward to hearing those. So that about does it for this week's episode. If you are enjoying MuggleCast, and we hope you are, make sure you're following MuggleCast for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode every Tuesday. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.